All right, folks, um, welcome. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I really appreciate it. I heard the sun just came out, and uh, the weather is nice, so all the more kudos for you uh, to come. Um, tonight, we are really excited to, to welcome uh, Pam Jaquila, um, but I just want to give a few words of introduction for why you all are here. Um, uh, this talk is funded by something called the E.M. Scourup Fund. Um, he was a class of 1937. And the purpose of that fund, and I'll read it, is, quote, to further international economics through a lecture series, open forum, and or financial publications of selected lectures pertaining to world economics. So um, we are certainly going to do that tonight. But um, thanks to Pam's generosity and energy, we've gotten a lot more, um, I would say. Uh, this morning, I sat in on a lecture in Econ 24 Development Economics on a totally different topic, and Pam uh, held the audience wrapped and engaged, and students coming up to her afterwards, um, and um, Pam had a chance to meet with a couple of our faculty members today, so um, I'm really grateful for your energy and, and generosity uh, with that. Um, so um, with that, I'll just offer a brief introduction to, to Pam's distinguished career thus far. Um, Pamela Jaquila is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development, uh, where she studies gender issues, uh, behavioral de development economics, survey design and measurement, and impact evaluation. Um, prior to the Center for Global Development, um, Pam was a professor at Washington University, St. Louis, um, and also at the University of Maryland, where she still holds a position as an associate professor. Um, Pam earned her bachelor's degree in uh, a self-created, as I understood, a degree in s uh, sustainable development at University of Michigan, um, a master's uh, and MSc in development from the Lon London School of Economics, and she earned her PhD um, in economics at UC Berkeley. Um, her work has been published in many leading academic journals, and um, I was scrolling through the, the pages and pages of, of publications today, but um, some of those journals have been included science, the review of economic studies, um, but also um, more uh, uh, audiences like me, lay audiences in the New York Times or in NPR. Um, and her current work, um, some of which we'll hear about today, includes research on women's labor force participation, participation um, and occupational choice, um, the gender dynamics of investments in early childhood, and the impacts of cash grants on uh, entrepreneurs. So with that uh, very brief introduction, um, I uh, really want to thank you for coming um, here today. And let's give her a uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so I should start by saying that this is joint work with Owen Osier, who's uh, at the World Bank. Language structures our thought. Every time we speak, every time we think, we organize the world using a set of grammatical rules that we've been internalizing since childhood. Different languages organize the world in different ways. So writing almost 100 years ago now, the linguist Benjamin Lee Whorf said, languages differ not only in how they build their sentences, but also in how they break down nature to secure elements to put in those sentences. So in other words, language, different languages don't just have different words for the same idea, they split the world up into different sets of constructs and ideas. Now, uh, you've probably already heard uh, some cute stories about the Inuit and how they have seven or 17 or 70 different words for snow. These strongest forms of this theory of linguistic determinism have largely been debunked. So it is not the case that we can only think of things for which there is a word in our language. Uh, it is not the case that you know, we're that tightly constrained by the structure and the vocabulary, vocabulary that are available to us. Human beings are tremendously inventive. And yet, increasingly, there is evidence that the languages that we speak influence our, nudge our thoughts, influence our thoughts in subtle and often subconscious ways. Uh, so I want to just sort of briefly give you one of the most famous of examples of that, which is the case of what's called Russian blue. So the Russian blue story sort of uh, illustrates how our, the way we think and uh, the processes of thought may be shaped by the languages that we speak. So in Russian uh, and also in Greek, there are different obligatory words for light blue and dark blue. So in English, we have pink and red, and you wouldn't refer to pink as light red. Uh, in Russian and in Greek, it's the same with, tur with turquoise and navy. So there are different words for light blue and dark blue. And so recent studies suggest that there's this sort of notion that that might help 
native speakers of Greek or Russian to process different types of blue more quickly. And indeed, recent studies suggest that if you're given tasks like determining whether a shade of blue in between is closer to light or dark, or recognizing a triangle on a colored background, native speakers of Russian and Greek do better at these tasks uh, when the two blues that they're comparing break over this line that they've been used to distinguishing as separate colors relative to who, how they do on with light and dark greens, whereas you don't see that sort of pattern among German speakers, for instance. So this is one example of how the structure of how a language is organized and how it divides up the world might influence our thinking on a very small scale, but in a way that we're not even aware of. So today we're going to be talking about the specific case of gender and language. So as we all know, uh, so societal views, social norms, attitudes about the appropriate role for women in society differ markedly across cultures. So this is data from the most recent round of the World Values Survey, and it shows the percent of different uh, respondents across countries agreeing with different statements. So one, when jobs are scarce, men should have more of a right to a job than women. You see that in countries like Australia, this is a very minority view. And in other countries, more than four-fifths of the population agree with that statement. We see this also with the statement, when a woman works, the children suffer. So again, there's a huge variety in typical attitudes across different societies and cultures around the world. And so social scientists are very interested in what factors might shape these, these different views. Now, the idea has been around since the time of Worf that one, way, one factor that might be shaping these views is different, uh, different manifestations of gender within language. So there are a lot of different ways many of which you've probably reflected on, that different languages make gender distinctions more or less salient. Uh, so today what I'm going to be talking about is perhaps the most subtle of these, the system of nominal classification, grammatical gender. So this is, as in Spanish or French, uh, assigning different inanimate objects to different uh, grammatical categories, two of which are masculine and feminine. So this is one very subtle way that language may make the fact that the world is partitioned into masculine and feminine more salient. There are also less subtle ways. So uh, there's been a lot of debate, uh, particularly in European countries recently, about whether you should have separate words for male and female versions of the same occupations, prof professor, uh, professor versus professora in Spanish. Uh, and then, of course, even in English, uh, we have different pronouns for men and women. Many languages do this, but not all. And there's discussion of whether this makes gender distinctions more salient as well. But a lot of the focus has been on this most subtle of these, which is about the use of these grammatical gender systems. So again, the idea that these systems, though we typically think of them as arbitrary, may translate into uh, different, uh, different perceptions of men and women's role in the world goes back to the work of Benjamin Lee Worf who said that grammatical gender creates a habitual consciousness of two sex classes as a standard classificatory fact in our thought world, uh, which translated into English is basically saying that when you go around partitioning nouns into male and masculine and feminine, you're training your brain that other aspects of your life, of, the, of social and economic reality, should be so organized, should be also partitioned into masculine and feminine. Now, Benjamin Lee Worf basically advanced no empirical evidence to demonstrate that this is the case. This was just a hypothesis. But it's the hypothesis that we're going to be talking about today. And what we're going to be doing today is thinking about how one would go about testing for this association. And so there are a few different papers now by economists and political scientists and linguists that have tried to use a variety of approaches to try and explore this question. So one really interesting paper is work by Perez and Tavitz in the Journal of Politics. So this is an experiment that shows the sort of uh, proper, the power of, of grammatical gender. It's an, a survey experiment done with Estonians who are bilingual in Estonian and Russian. Now, Estonian is a non-gender language, so it doesn't mark distinctions between masculine and feminine in any way, and Russian is a gender language. So what's interesting in this study is they randomized among bilinguals whether you were interviewed in Estonian or Russian. And they found that if you were interviewed in Estonian, you showed greater support for gender equality. 
even though whether what language you were interviewed in was randomly assigned. So it's clear that there are these sort of subconscious links within individuals. Now, when we try to look across languages, most of the work that's out there has done one of two things, sometimes both. So one is to focus on a set of countries, such as European countries, where it's reasonable to think of most of the people within a country as native speakers of a single national language that is well documented. And when people move beyond that, they've typically used a data set called the World Atlas of Language Structures. So the World Atlas of Language Structures is a great data set that characterizes a lot of different aspects of language. In terms of grammatical gender, it characterizes about 500 different languages uh, in terms of their grammatical gender structure. But these languages are, do not include many of the world's sort of the most widely spoken languages, particularly in developing countries. And this is important because a lot of the world's linguistic heterogeneity today is in Africa and in Asia. And a lot of those languages are missing from the, public, uh, the publicly available data. So what we're gonna, I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to talk about our research where we have built a new data set that expands the set of languages for which we have documented the grammatical gender structure to about 4,300 languages. And we do this by going to a range of sources, so pedagogical materials, reference grammars, et cetera, that explicitly state whether languages do or do not use grammatical gender. And this has allowed us to really expand the set of languages whose grammatical gender structure is documented, uh, particularly in developing countries. So in India, the World Atlas of Language Structure, the WALS, codes, the, uh, codes six different languages. We code 281. In Kenya, the WALS codes three languages. We code all 51 of the languages. And so this gives us a lot more statistical power to make inference about the association between grammatical gender and different outcomes related to gender equality. And so specifically, we're going to be focusing on women's labor force participation and, women, and women's educational attainment. And so what I'm going to do once I describe this data is I'm going to estimate the cross-country relationship between grammatical gender and women's labor force participation and educational attainment, and then also the relationship with gender attitudes among men and women. Uh, and then, uh, as a first step toward trying to understand whether this association might represent a causal relationship, I'm going to show you the same associations looking within countries rather than across countries. And so I'm going to look in two parts of the world where uh, gender and non-gender languages are both indigenous and widely spoken. And so those two parts of the world are in the Sahelian, the belt just south of the Sahel in Africa and in India. And I'm going to show you that the same negative associations we see when we look across countries are also present when we look within countries. Okay, and so just to sort of give you an outline of what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a bit more about what we mean by grammatical gender and how, uh, through a conceptual framework, talk about how we think it might relate to outcomes today and what some of the uh, concerns are in thinking about whether this, is a, with this correlation is causal. I'll describe our data collection, and then I'll talk through this cross-country and within-country analysis. Um, OK, so I just want to give you a preview of the main results before I, before I get too much further. Um, so I'm going to show you that about 38% of the world's population speaks a gender-native language. Uh, and that women who grow up speaking gender languages are less likely to be in the labor force, and they're also less likely to complete primary school. And this is true both across and within countries. Um, and then um, I'll show you in the cross-country data that both men and women who grow up speaking gender languages hold more traditional views of women's role in society. So I want to sort of say right here what I'm not going to do in this talk is magically come up with some sort of unambiguous causal evidence here, OK? So often you hear economists give talks, and I, you know, this could be me a few hours ago giving a talk, and I'll say, I randomized this treatment, and so I can tell you that this is the impact of this treatment. When we think about these big historical and cultural processes, we should be very cautious about causality. And I'm not going to magically pull some instrumental variable out of my pocket to say, and now I show you the exact causal effect. I'm going to instead approach this from the other direction, and I'm going to try to talk through, I'm going to show you this association, and then talk through, if this were not causal, what would the likely explanations be? And I'll show you that we can take apart some of those and rule them out. And so we're left with a more restrictive set of possible things that might be causing this empirical relationship, any of which is reasonably interesting. OK, so let me start by talking about what I mean by grammatical gender. So 
Many languages have a system for categorizing nouns. Uh, and so you can think about, uh, so we can call these noun classes, or sometimes these are referred to as gender. And so uh, what these are is a way of partitioning the set of nouns. Uh, and so you, these may be familiar to you. So the most, um, I think most of you are probably uh, familiar with Spanish or French, where you can think of all nouns as being masculine or feminine, and they have certain properties in common. So in Spanish, masculine words tend to end in O, uh, while feminine words tend to end in A. You also see this with uh, other noun class systems that don't involve gender. So the system of noun classes in Swahili has a bunch of similar categories. So little items uh, are at the core of what's called the key V class. So the chair is kiti, two chairs is viti. Um, humans and other animates are in a different class. It functions exactly like a grammatical gender system in Spanish, except it's not based on gender. Um, but it's not the sort of similarities in prefix or in, in letters that are defining these categories. What's defining a grammatical gender category or a noun class is agreement. Okay, So a class is a set of words that follow the same agreement rules in the same conditions. So in Swahili, if I wanted to say these new chairs, I would say viti vipia hivi. So you see that this V that it appears in the plural of chair because it's in the key V class is also the prefix for new, and it appears in, v, in these as well. But if I wanted to say these new teachers, it's in a different agreement class. So instead, I would need to say walimu wapia hawa. So it's got the wa uh, conjugation instead of V. This works the same way that gender works in Spanish. So in Spanish, I want to say the white shirt, la camisa blanca. So I see that it's feminine. It's ending in A. I'm using la. My adjective is being modified to end in A. But if I wanted to say the white hat, I would instead say el sombrero blanco. OK, so again, to speak correctly, you need to know what gender or what class a word is because it needs to, it determines how agreement works. So even though these things are essentially arbitrary, they're very salient because every time you speak, you're having to call up which class you're in. Uh, OK. So what we're going to do in this talk is we're going to focus on defining a grammatical gender system as a system that includes masculine and feminine of two, as two of the agree, uh, obligatory noun classes determining agreement, and then groups so, at least some inanimate objects in there. So this is salient in the, in the sense that English is not a gender language in this construction. And the reason that we do this, it seems like there are different definitions of gender languages. This is the one that best lines up with historical records, historical documentation, which I'll show you we use in some of our data collection. Now, this is one dimension along which languages can make gender more or less salient. But even within gender languages, there's a huge amount of variation in how salient this distinction is. So you have cases where masculine and feminine might not be the only noun classes. There could be neuter, as in German or Russian. Or you could have, in fact, many different noun classes, two of which are masculine and feminine. So it could be less often that you're doing this sort of agreeing with, with a, a gender-based agreement system. And then there's also the question of how many parts of speech have to change in order to characterize agreement. So it could just be adjectives, it could be verbs, and it, could, uh, and it varies in how much this is really shaping the way the entire sentence is structured versus just coming up uh, sometimes with some adjectives. I'm not going to be able to code all of these dimensions uh, in the research I'm talking about today, but it's important to keep in mind that we're effectively averaging over these different dimensions. OK. Now, if you ever took French or Spanish class, as I did, you were probably told at one point in your life that these things are arbitrary. Uh, so Mark Twain here famously says in German, a young lady has no sex while a turnip has. Uh, and in fact, I gave this talk at Harvard and MIT a couple weeks ago, and Esther Duflo, a famous de French development economist, was sitting in the front row, and she said, you know, I'm not going to try to impersonate Esther's accent. That's just going to get me in trouble. But she said, you know, I would think that growing up with a language like this would teach you that it made no sense, because why is the table a woman? Uh, which I think is just echoing Mark Twain's sentiments here. Um, and yet, there is some evidence that, uh, at least in terms of which languages 
uh, which words get assigned to different categories, sometimes these classifications do have a certain, what you might call, cultural intelligibility. So famously, George Lakoff has a book about uh, the Australian Aboriginal language gerbil, in which women are grouped in a category together with fire and dangerous things that might be able to hurt you. Uh, and in another case, there is a case of a uh, Siberian language ket, and someone describing this language, who is apparently unaware of irony, said that certain small mammals like squirrels were feminine because they are of no importance to the cats. Uh, and then in many, so for instance, in the Indo-Aryan languages, uh, there are stereotypes about the same noun can be masculine or feminine, uh, depending on whether it's uh, large and sturdy or small and round, the masculine being large and sturdy and small and round. Whereas in other uh, gender languages, you have the same kind of convention that the same noun can be masculine or feminine, uh, but the masculine might, is sometimes long and skinny, and the, fema the feminine is actually the round version. So different stereotypes about bodies are sometimes reflected in uh, the masculine and feminization of the same object. Um, I want to sort of describe an experiment that gets at slightly more subtle linkages. So this is work done by Lara Boroditsky. And in this experiment, uh, subjects who are native speakers of Spanish or German, but residing in the United States, fluent in English, are shown pictures of objects that were chosen because they have different grammatical genders in Spanish and German. Okay, And they were asked to provide English adjectives to characterize these different objects. So shown a picture of a key, the native German speaker said the key is hard, heavy, jagged, metal, and serrated, whereas the native Spanish speakers described the same picture of a key as golden, intricate, little, lovely, shiny. Now at this point, you might be saying, OK, that's fine, but this is just because these guys are German speakers. <laughs> they don't have time for adjectives like intricate and lovely. They're serious. Uh, and so it's not because the key is uh, masculine in German and feminine in Spanish. So then you can look at what happened when they were shown a picture of a bridge. The German speakers now describe the bridge as beautiful, elegant, fragile, peaceful, and pretty whereas the Spanish speakers describe the same bri bridge as big, dangerous, sturdy, strong, et cetera, consistent with the opposite mapping of genders. So there's some evidence, experimental evidence, that the assignment of words to different categories is not, uh, is not actually quite as innocuous as we might think. Now, this is about words and not about the overall institution of the grammatical structure, right? But Worf's original hypothesis was not about this mapping of words to culture. It was about a mapping from structure to culture, uh, which is a more contentious uh, notion, I believe, in the linguistic literature. But my discussant will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and so a lot of the evidence linking these structures to uh, two different outcomes in terms of women's equality is actually coming from the economics literature, from the political scientists, um, which is also a bit about the outcomes that are being looked at. But as I've already discussed, a lot of this work is either sort of case studies of a couple of languages or uh, work that's building on the publicly available data sets. And so what we're going to do is to try to, to expand this to allow us to look more rigorously at this relationship. So before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about how we think of this mechanism working. And I promise I'm going to cut out most of the most painful economics here. But I, I want to talk about, because it's important when we think about how we view this in terms of correlation or causation. If this relationship that Worf hypothesized exists, where the tendency to partition nouns into masculine versus feminine is a little nudge to, to partition other aspects of the world in that way, then we should think about this as operating at two levels. So that sort of, Worf is postulating a behavioral economics, the grammatical gender, where we're training our brain in this way, and then you know, that nudges you, that slightly changes the cost when you enter other domains to think of them as either masculine or feminine. Now, the thing about grammatical gender is that it changes very, very slowly. And in most cases, when we think about the grammatical gender of the world's languages today, we're talking about uh, 
things that changed in language at least a thousand or several thousand years ago. So English is a relatively recent case, losing grammatical gender between 800 and 1300 AD. Uh, and so what's important about that is if this nudge exists, then it's been doing, it's been nudging us for a long time, okay? So then we also want to think about the fact that grammatical gender structures are not recent innovations. And so if this behavioral economic story is true, then when we look at the association today, we're not just looking at the, the effect of a nudge today, we're looking at the effect of a nudge over thousands of years shifting our social institutions in a particular direction. And so we need to think about, so even perhaps when grammatical gender disappears, if uh, this tendency to partition facilitates the creation of institutions that tend to partition the genders, then those can persist in society even after grammatical gender, and then we're picking up the impact of those institutions which may take on a life of their own in addition to this nudge. And so we can think about, you know, the main story here is one, uh, the main behavioral story is one where grammatical gender is basically a heuristic that predisposes us to think in a certain way, but if you have grammatical gender today, then in most cases you also had it 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, and so that nudge has been going on for a long time. So this means that the main concern when we think about is this a causal relationship or just a correlation is not anything about the characteristics of societies today. The characteristics of societies today could not possibly have caused grammatical gender because grammatical gender has been around for thousands of years. What we're worried about is confounds characterizing societies 2,000 or 3,000 years ago when grammatical gender was happening and whether those are likely to, uh, could be sort of driving the correlation that we see. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit later the steps that we can take to try to address that. Um, yeah, so in the paper, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna skip through this quickly. Uh, we sort of like, we try to formalize this notion of the behavioral economics of grammatical gender. And I just wanna tell you a little bit because it illustrates how we think we've kind of brought Worf's idea into modern economics. We have a model where basically you have a tendency to view a domain as either masculine or feminine if it is too dominated by either males or females. So this is sort of, you know, we all perceive that if we're in the extreme minority, we may not fit in. In this, in this model, you tend to think about that in terms of gender. And so if the proportion females is sufficiently low, you know, say you're at an economics conference, then you might think you're in a masculine domain. I'm sorry, that was, that was a nasty joke. Uh, and if the proportion females is too high, then you might think you're in a feminine domain. Uh, okay, and so, and of course, if you're somewhere in between, then you might not be in a gendered domain. And so the way we think about formalizing this nudge is that it can either make the cost you pay, so if, you, if I'm a woman and I wanna go into a masculine domain, there's some sort of psychic cost. So grammatical gender can make the cost higher or it can make this space of gender neutral equilibria smaller. And so what's important to note about this is that the model is symmetric. It is not saying that grammatical gender predisposes you to think of women as bad or weak or they should be confined. It works both ways for the two genders in this framework. So the same forces that keep women out of the workforce are gonna be keeping men out of the home and other domains that are traditionally perceived as feminine. And so it's important to, to sort of think through how this tendency per, to partition is not just, you know, it's not just being thrown at, so then you're backward, you have backwards views about women's roles. It's that you think there's an appropriate place for men and an appropriate place for women. And so we can look for evidence of that in different contexts. Okay, I'm gonna skip through the costs, and this is just what I've said, that this is, uh, you know, the model itself is symmetric, uh, and then it's sort of, you know, human biology that makes it so that home is the natural place for women, uh, because as, you know, anthropologists like David Lancey have, have observed, in every human society, women play a disproportionate, uh, do a disproportionate share of child-related tasks, which then tends to keep them in the home. Yes? You know this isn't an economics seminar, right? Go, no, I'm kidding, go ahead. If you think uh, that you know, people are thinking through uh, categories and these are people's sort of implicit... Oh, hi. Um, uh, if, if you think people are thinking through uh, categories and these are people's inherited mental architecture, 
then do you think that uh, you know when you put people under time or other constraints, you'd see these implicit uh, reactions expressing themselves more strongly? So when you ask people to do a resume audit thing or an implicit association test, you should see these things coming out, if that is indeed the mechanism. Yeah, so I think you're asking a question that I agree with. I wouldn't quite say, I'm not sure what I think about the role of time pressure. Um, I mean, I think that you're right to say that if people have this tendency to think in categories, and not just categories, but categories related to gender, then you ought to be able to design experiments that explicitly test that. And I think that's exactly right. You know, somebody should do that. I'm busy trying to finish this paper. Um, but no, I mean, I, I think that's exactly right. I'm not sure, you know, I mean, I think it depends on how you think of the model working, whether explicitly time pressure would make it come out more strongly. But in a variety, you could think of a variety of lab tasks where you can, you know, partition people along any dimension and several are possible. Are they more likely to partition based on gender? I think definitely a, a testable prediction of this model would be, you could look at in context like that. Yes. Okay. So, right, so this is just coming back to where we were. Uh, and so again, so we think of, so this is just, but that cost part is just what we think about today. And of course, if that's true, that can translate into uh, institutions. So institutions about what is appropriate for men and women and norms and beliefs, all of which then can take on something of a life of their own by creating social costs and equilibrium. Okay. So I want to describe to you how we put together this data set. So we start from the ethnologue, which is the most comprehensive database of languages. Uh, it includes over 7,000 languages. We focus on uh, 6,190 of them that are uh, oral, so spoken languages that are not extinct, and in fact, that are not classified as dying. So class languages that are classified as dying and have fewer than 100 speakers, we exclude from our database because we want to focus on the languages that characterize the you know, most of the world's population. Um, and we're particularly interested in sort of this uh, trying to get all of the languages because what you see when you look at the number of languages per country is that a lot of the linguistic heterogeneity in the world is in Africa and Asia and in areas that are not very well covered in the existing public data sets. Um, and so this is sort of part of what motivated us to do this project. So we use a very broad range of sources in putting together this database. So we start from the World Atlas of Language Structures. Uh, and then, so a great data source for anyone looking for a fun data source that you can look at online is the Linguistic Survey of India. Uh, it's a, I think, 13-volume thing compiled by George Abraham Grierson, who was a British colonial official. And he probably should have been doing something else related to governing British India. But instead, he was compiling this documentation about 400 different South Asian languages and literatures. Uh, then there's the Compendium of World Languages. And then for other languages, we use a wide range of sources, so language textbooks, uh, monographs, so reference grammars, uh, academic papers and linguistics journals. In a couple of cases, we actually built a survey that we sent to translators and native speakers for languages we couldn't document otherwise. Uh, so a wide range of sources. Um, and what we try to do, but we're trying, we're not sort of writing a new grammar of each of these languages, and we're not trying to pretend that we're linguists. So we're just coding an indicator for any system of grammatical gender, and then if we can, we note whether it is dichotomous or not. So whether it's just masculine and feminine, or whether there's, there are other non-gender categories. And we don't go beyond that. And you'll see what we do uh, is we basically, so we just rely on the text of what the different sources say. So you can see some examples here. So for each language that we code, so these 4,316 languages, uh, we have the source that we get the characterization from and a quote characterizing it. So you see here, uh, these are non-gender languages. So the use of gender is governed by non-linguistic factors, i.e. by the actual sex of the referent. Or in modern mythili, has, modern mythili has no grammatical gender. So we get these unambiguous statements or you know, there is no grammatical gender. Or the flip side, Serbian, three grammatical genders, uh, masculine, feminine, and neuter. So these explicit statements that we're able to code. And for 2,500, 
of the 4,300 languages, we have two different sources, and they agree in all but two cases. So we're pretty confident that we're doing this correctly. Um, and so we're able to classify more than 95% of the population in all but eight countries. So we account for 99.5% of the world's population as represented by the ethnologue. So we're able to, so even though we only get 4,300 out of 6,200 languages, the, most of the languages we don't get are quite small, and so we get the overwhelming majority of the population. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit then about the structure of the variation that we see. So these are the uh, 15 biggest language families in terms of the number of languages in them in the ethnologue. Um, and what I've done is I've coded the non-gender languages are blue, the gender languages are orange, and the languages that we don't know the characterization of are in gray. Um, and so the thing that jumps out about this is a lot of the variation, not all of the variation, but a lot of the variation is across language families, okay? So the intraclass correlation uh, is 0.69, which is quite high, which is saying that if you want to ask this question, then you want to do it, you're going to need to do it using a cross-family variation if you want to have statistical power. So there is not that much variation within language family. There may be some, but in most cases, there is not a lot of variation within the language family. Um, okay, and so what we find is that, and I should say this is the officially World Bank approved map. All of the other maps, the World Bank does not, has not approved, so you didn't, you didn't see them from me. Um, so uh, the, only 10% of the languages in the database use grammatical gender systems but 38% of the world's population speaks a gender language, okay? Now, this should make you think, are these languages different than other languages? Is there something else going on about these societies? Okay, and so the concern, as we talked about before, is that it's not the gender structure, it's something else about the societies 3,000, 4,000, 2,000 years ago that is predicting both these traditional gender attitudes and, uh, and whether you have grammatical gender. So what can we do to address this? Well, when you have a problem with omitted variable bias, the best thing you can do is try to control directly for the things that are biasing the relationship of interest. And so the way that we're going to approach this is we're going to take data from the Ethnographic Atlas, which is a database that was compiled over the course of the 60s and 70s by the anthropologist George Murdoch. Um, it was published over 20 years in Ethnology, which is an anthropological journal, and it characterizes almost 1,200 societies, uh, and it just compiles everything that is known from ethnographies about these different societies. And so it has a host of different variables characterizing maritable pra marital practices, agricultural practices, residence patterns, all sorts of things, okay? And so what we do is we take the ethnologue, which is a language level data set, and then we merge in the ethnographic atlas at the level of the society, okay? So then we can ask, are there characteristics of society, ethnographic characteristics of societies that predict whether your society, whether your language has grammatical gender. And so uh, we, again, we end up excluding a few languages that are extinct or dying because we did not collect grammatical gender data on those. So we're left with about 1,100 entries in the ethnographic atlas. Uh, and so then we're able to merge all but 13 of those into the ethnologue. Um, and then 824 of those societies map to ethnologue languages for which we know the gender structure. Uh, and this is to 756 unique languages. So there are cases where within the ethnographic atlas, multiple societies will merge to the same language. Uh, and also there are cases where within the ethnologue, multiple languages will merge to, this, merge to the same ethnographic atlas society. So we handle all of these by hand and, this, and we get this sort of database of merged cases. Now this is only 756 ethnologue languages, so there is measurement error here, but they do account for 4.5 billion people. So they account for most of the world's population. So then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, can we predict which societies end up having a gender language? 
And so there are a bunch of different ways that you can do this. So you can just run a regression. You can use machine learning tools. And they all get the same answer. And you can have different specifications depending on whether you do this analysis at the ethnologue language level or the ethnographic atlas society level. There are three robust predictors across all of these different specifications. OK? One is the use of the plow, which if you've been following economics, or reading Esther Bostrup in the last 30, 40 years, this should not be a surprise. The other is whether you have used domesticated horses or camels. And a third, and as someone who has breastfed two children in the last 10 years, I have to say this one really speaks to me, is whether you milk your domestic animals. Um, so these are three things that predict, that characterize societies that tend to have gender languages. Now, what's interesting about this is none of these is actually inherently about gender norms within a society, OK? None of these is about whether men and women do tasks separately or together, or whether the society is matrilocal or patrilocal, or descent patterns. Uh, so we do find that there are ethnographic characteristics that predict the use of grammatical gender, but they do not appear to relate to gender norms. Nevertheless, what we're going to do in the subsequent analysis is we're going to use these as controls in all of our specifications. So in, in addition to a bunch of uh, geographic controls, we're just going to control for those characteristics uh, of societies that, uh, that predict grammatical gender so that we can try to rule out these historical confounds. OK, so now I'm going to show you the cross-country uh, analysis. So I'm going to show you three different classes of outcomes. So the labor force participation data comes from the World Bank's World Development Indicators, and it's available for 177 countries. Uh, educational attainment comes from the Barrow-Lee Educational Attainment Data Set, which is available for 142 countries. Um, and gender attitudes come from the World Value Survey, but they're only available for 56 countries. So uh, the data is a lot less rich for those outcomes. OK. so. Uh, I'm going to show you first the association between uh, grammatical gender and women's labor force participation. So what I'm looking at is for each country, so I have this ethnologue database that is at the language level. And then for each country, I'm able to say what fraction of the population speaks a native language that is a gender language. So the ethnologue tells you not only the characteristics of the languages, but it gives you an estimate of the number of native speakers in each country. And so we can use those, sum up over those, to calculate the fraction of a country's population that speaks a gender native language. So here I've got two different outcome variables. One is the level of female labor force participation. And then the other is the gender gap, so the difference between women's labor force participation and men's. So that's going to difference out any characteristics of societies that make some countries different than others. And so you can see, just looking here, that there's this relationship in the cross section. So countries that have a higher proportion of grammatical gender speakers, uh, native, speakers of native languages who are gender, that are gender languages, so darker bars, tend to have lower women's labor force participation and larger gap, gender gaps. When you put this in a regression framework, so the blue bars are not covariate adjusted. So these are just the correlations. And then the green bars are when you adjust by including those ethnographic atlas characteristics along with a host of uh, other geographic characteristics uh, that cannot be determined by grammatical gender. You see that you get this negative relationship. You get a negative relationship in the levels. You get a negative relationship in the gender gap. So we see, and this is in percentage point terms, so this is a pretty substantial association here that grammatical gender is associated with basically a 10 percentage point uh, decline in women's labor force participation or increase in the gender gap in labor force participation. OK? So you know, you can, you, I don't need to tell you that 10 percentage points is a big deal. Uh, so this could fully explain the disparity in female labor force participation between Jamaica uh, where most people's native language is Jamaican English, and the Dominican Republic. And you see that's moving from the 30th percentile to about the median. Now, when we look at educational attainment, and I'm going to focus to, for comparability across data sets, I'm going to focus on primary school completion. What you see is that there's, no, there's not this sort of jumping out at you first order correlation. And so this is, you know, as development economists, as people who study development, we know that this is true. 
Uh, we know that this is true because the places that have low female primary school completion tend to be Africa uh, in particular, also South Asia, Southeast Asia. Those are places that have a very high fraction of speakers of non-gender languages. And the second thing to note is that the gaps overall are much smaller, okay? So if just to go back for comparison, the gender gap uh, in female labor force participation, you can see it's quite large. I think the average across countries is something like 25 percentage points. Uh, the gender gap in primary school completion, the average cr across countries is like five percentage points. So it's a much smaller gap because most countries have legislated away gender gaps as, primary, as they mandated primary school completion. Um, and yet, when you look at the relationship between grammatical gender and women's, labor, uh, women's primary school completion, you see that uh, it's consistently negative. And once you adjust for these different controls, it's also consistently statistically significant. Uh, so primary school completion, you see this uh, actually quite large difference. Uh, the gap uh, is just a bit larger, uh, but is statistically significant. When we look at attitudes, so uh, there are, in the World Value Survey, there are eight different questions about whether, uh, basically trying to gauge different gender attitudes. And what you can see is that, oh, sorry. What you can see is that almost all of them are, fall into this model of, is the appropriate situation in the world one in which women, the women's sphere is the home and the men's sphere is outside of the home. So when a mother works for pay, the children suffer. When, when jobs are scarce, men should have more right to a job than women. On the whole, men make better political leaders than women, uh, make better business executives. Being a housewife is just as fulfilling as working for pay. These are all about this idea that basically a women, woman's place is in the home. And you can see that when we look at the relationship with each of these, uh, there's a statistically significant relationship between the proportion grammatical gender across countries and six of the eight different uh, questions. And when I pull them into an index, uh, I get a relationship that is significant at the 99% level. Um, again, you may want to know how big this relationship is. And so the association would be sufficient to explain the variation between Belarus, which is basically at the median, and Trinidad and Tobago, which is at the um, 80th percentile in terms of support for uh, women's equality. Now, in the context of labor force participation and primary school completion, we're interested in gaps. But in terms of attitudes, the theory here is not that a gap would make sense, right? It's not that men have bad, bad gender attitudes and they impose them on women. And so what we see is that even when, when we look separately by gender, we see basically the same pattern for these different outcomes for men and for women. So maybe they're a little bit stronger for men, but we can never reject the statistical equality of these associations for men and for women. Um, and you can see this in a regression framework here as well. Bars are smaller for women, but we can never reject that they're equal, and they're always statistically significant. OK, so I want to talk briefly. I'm going to keep it short. I want to go on one statistical digression. So one criticism of this type of work that has been raised, so I am going to talk about the permutation test. You were suggesting I, I shouldn't. Uh, one criticism of this type of work is that it assumes an independence across languages. Right, So languages evolve within language families. So as we all know, the Indo-European language family, which includes English and French and German and the Indo-Aryan languages, it's one family. And those families evolve from a common ancestor. And we saw that most of the variation that we're talking about is actually across families. And so how do you deal with the fact that these languages within a family are not independent? Well. In econometrics, the right way to deal with it is to treat this as a clustering problem. Okay, And so what we'd like to do is cluster at the language family level. But we can't do that, and not at the language family level, because there's lots of within, uh, because there's lots of variation within families. But we can't do this because languages break across multiple countries. Okay, So each country has many languages, often drawn from different families or clusters. And so what, we're gonna, what we do in the paper is we develop a statistical test that addresses this, a permutation test. And so the way that we do this is we say, OK, well, what should we think about as the level at which treatment is assigned? 
Well, within the language tree, so I'm going to show you this in the context of a piece of the Dravidian fam language family tree. Within the language tree, you have some families that are just homogenous in their gender structure, and so we're going to treat those as one cluster. But for families that have variation, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the highest level, find the highest level of the tree that we can go to where there's variation in grammatical gender structure. Okay, so here you've got basically four languages at one end of the northern branch of the Dravidian family language tree, and they differ in grammatical gender structure. So Brahui has no grammatical gender. Other languages with the same tree structure have grammatical gender. So those are going to be treated as independent clusters. But when we move down to these two branches, the central branch and the south central branch, you have uh, these branches have no variation. So these are all gender languages within each of these branches. So then this is as high up the tree as we can go. We can go all the way up to here and see no variation in assignment in treatment assignment, different types of grammatical gender. So what we're going to do is create clusters that are that represent as far as we can go up the language tree with homo homogeneous grammatical gender. So if a language family is all one grammatical gender structure, then that family is a cluster. If there's variation with a f within a family, as there is here, we would make a cluster that is all of these languages that are non-gender, and another cluster that is all of these languages that are gender. So this represents the actual observed variation in gender structure within the language tree. And then we use this to conduct a permutation test. And so the way that we do it is we're going to randomly permute treatment. So we're going to generate, so there are 206 clusters defined in this way, and 67 of them are gender clusters. So we're going to say, OK, how could we reassign 67 treated clusters across these 206 clusters? We do that 10,000 times. And each time, we then collapse the data set to create a hypothetical assignment of grammatical gender across countries. And we rerun our cross-country analysis on this hypothetical data set. So what's nice about this permutation test-based approach is whatever the true structure of the errors, this is going to give us statistical tests that are correct in the sense of being having the correct size. So we're not going to be treating these observations as independent anymore when we shouldn't be. And so I just want to show you briefly, so looking at our results for labor force participation, what you can see is that so we run this, we run this whole process of analysis 10,000 times, but it's hypothetical. So this is under the null hypothesis. There is no relationship. And as you would expect, most of those coefficients are very close to zero. Typically, the relationship, the association we estimate is very close to zero. But what you can see is you can count up the number of times we see a relationship that is at least as big as the one that we estimate. And that gives you an indication of the p-value of your statistical test. So what I'm showing you here is our permutation test-based p-values as compared to OLS. Now, what's nice about this is that we do this, and we see that it actually does matter. So for some outcomes, more than others. But you can see if you just treat the languages as independent, you're going to overstate the degree of statistical significance. But uh, across these different outcomes, the, the outcomes that were significant before are statistically significant after we implement uh, this permutation test, with the notable exception of uh, women's gender attitudes. And you can see, and this is partially because gender attitudes, we only have 56 countries. It's also telling you a lot of the variation that you observe is within uh, clusters that are not actually independent. It matters a lot. When we look at things like primary school, instead we see that it matters very little in terms of the p-values. So adjusting for this non-independence is important, uh, but we're able to do it and show that this relationship still holds. OK. So in my last few minutes, I want to talk a bit about cross-country or within-country work. Uh, so you saw in the map that there are kind of two different major regions of the world that have a lot of variation within country in grammatical gender structure. In, uh, and in particular, in non-colonial languages. So one region is this belt uh, just south of the Sahel. 
in sub-Saharan Africa. There are seven countries where between 10 and 90% of the population speaks a native language that is a gender language, so countries that have large gender and non-gender populations. And four of those are included in the Afrobarometer database. So this is a, a, repeat, a repeated cross-sectional survey of nationally representative samples of the populations of different African countries. So we use this. We use data from those four countries. Uh, so if for Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda, there are four rounds. Niger was only added in the last round. We get about 26,000 observations of adults, uh, of African adults, and they speak 167 different African native languages. Uh, in India, we also get, we get a similar setup. So you have variation within the Indo-European language family and within the Dravidian language family in grammatical gender. Uh, so we use the India Human Development Survey which includes data on 76,000 household heads and their spouses, for which we know their native language, and they speak 57 different native languages. So I'm just going to show you these results graphically. So I have a few different specifications looking at levels of female labor force participation or other outcomes versus uh, gender gaps. This is the pink is Africa, the green is India, and then I also have gender differences. And you see the triangles are without controls. The circles are with controls. Controls include uh, controlling for uh, different, different religions and interacting those with gender. Um, and so it's a pretty, it's a, a set of controls that has a lot of explanatory power. So what you can see is when you look at labor force participation, there's this negative and significant relationship in Africa, a similar negative relationship in India, but it's not statistically significant. When we look at primary school completion, uh, both the levels and the, um, the gender gap is negative and statistically significant in both the African country sample and in the Indian country sample. Uh, when we look at secondary school completion, uh, again, negative and significant in the African data, uh, negative and sometimes significant, sometimes not in the Indian data. So this exact pattern that we saw across countries replicates itself within countries in Africa and in India. Okay, so I want to conclude uh, by reflecting, by sort of going back to, to why would we should be interested in this. So obviously, you know, hopefully you found it inherently an interesting way to spend an hour, but it's also important from a policy perspective. And so what I've put up here is data on the relationship between the change in the gender gap in years of education across countries and the change in the gender gap in labor force participation on the y-axis. So when we look at the change in the gender gap in labor force participation, you see that it's gotten substantially smaller. So this is the distribution across countries over the last 25 years. The gender gap in educational attainment has also gotten smaller, but it's reduced by a lot less. But what's important here is that the association between these two changes is not there. It is essentially zero. Okay, So countries that have seen bigger declines in the gender gap in education have not seen bigger declines in the gender gap in labor force participation. So why is that important? Well, if you thought that women's equality in the workforce was a function of their human capital, so as their human capital through education caught up to men, women would catch up to men in terms of labor force participation, you would be wrong. It is not a story about human capital, OK? It's a story about social and psychological constraints on women's equality and their ability to fully participate in economic life. Now, this matters a lot, and it's almost certainly going to matter more over time, OK? So there's a recent paper by Chang Tai She and co-authors looking within the United States at the efficiency costs of discrimination. And so they look at, they model the change in the percentage of high skill occupations like doctors and lawyers that are done by women and by non-white men. That's increased dramatically over the last 30 or 40 years. And they're able to trace out the relationship between that increase and growth. And they argue that it accounts for more than a quarter of growth in GDP per capita over the last 40 or 50 years is because we've more efficiently got the high-skilled women and minorities in high-skill occupations. Now, 
For women, this is a story that only matters more over time because fertility has been going down dramatically. So the number of years that women are out of the labor force because they're busy having children is getting smaller over time. So these efficiency costs are only going to get larger. But the constraint is not an educational constraint. And so then it is important to try to understand what these factors are so that we can think about what the appropriate interventions would be to address them. OK? So what I've done today is try to do a tremendously deep dive onto one story of such a psychological constraint and how it might be working uh, subconsciously and culturally to limit women's equal involvement in economic life. By highlighting the way that language might subtly nudge women out of school, out of the labor force, we can think about what the right policy response to that would be. Now, what I've shown you should not convince you that this is 100% sure this is a causal relationship. But I hope what I've done is made you think that might be true. That could be true. And if it's true, and if it's anywhere near as big as it appears to be in the cross section, then we might want to think about what policies and what things we could do to address that. And if there are things that are not tremendously costly, it is probably worth doing because it appears to be the case that grammatical gender or something very strongly correlated with it is explaining a lot of women's inequality across educational outcomes and labor force outcomes. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. that um, uh, we're going to actually now have a discussant, Laura McPherson, from uh, our very own linguistics department. And I'm really grateful for Laura for being here today. Um, so we'll, we'll just have a, a, um, Laura will have a few words to say and then open for discussion and questions, et cetera. Thanks, Laura. Sorry, if I lean over to talk oh, to you. Oh, I see. Like, okay. yep, yep. Um, all right, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this awesome event. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Um, and thank you so much for that interesting and really thought-provoking talk. Um, just as a little bit of background for, to contextualize my own comments, um, I'm a theoretically trained linguist, um, and my work is founded upon field work and documentation of minority languages, primarily in West Africa, uh, but also in the Pacific. So this being said, I am not an economist, and I don't know much about statistics, so you know, take anything I say about that with a grain of salt. Right? We got the expert here on that. Um, so, um, as linguists, of course, we recognize the really important and sometimes detrimental role that language can play in reflecting and reinforcing a society's gender hierarchy, right? Um, but typically what we focus on as linguists um, or find the, the results for in linguistics is at the more lexical or discourse level rather than the structural level. And so by this I mean things like gendered pronouns, right, have shown to have a huge influence. Uh, if you have a job ad that says, you know, the candidate should be well qualified, he should have this, that, and the other quality, that's been shown to discourage women from applying for jobs like that. Uh, or lexical things like, you know, professor, professora, or in English, even without having grammatical gender, something like chairman, policeman, things like that have been shown to both reflect and reinforce uh, gender divisions, and it's hugely important. Um, at the discourse level, of course, you find non-gender languages like, you know, Japanese, where you have a complex honorific system. Uh, you know, certain politeness levels need to be maintained that can often reflect use, uh, or, you know, women are more strongly encouraged to use those sorts of systems than men are. It's not grammatical gender, but it's still reinforcing, you know, gender, gender hierarchies. And all of these things are really important to think about and have been shown to be, you know, real. Um, and, and detrimental. Um, on the structural side of things, though, which is more what Worf was getting at, um, the uh, effects tend to be um, harder to replicate, right? And linguists have tended to be much more skeptical about them. I think you've talked to some linguists uh, throughout the course of your work and probably have run into that. Um, so the problem is that a lot of the studies that are widely cited haven't held up to further scrutiny. So you know, one of the, the key and bridge mm -hmm. um, study, for instance, um, uh, would, uh, who was it? It was Micken and her colleagues tried to replicate this in 2014 and failed to do so. And so there may have been some issues in how the study was designed. Uh, the Chen paper on savings, uh, the you know, ability for one to save and having future versus non-future in your languages has also not been replicable. Um, or it's like the effects are much weaker than the original study uh, suggested that they would be. 
And so there's a lot of concerns about some of these studies that tend to be, especially the ones that are widely, widely cited. Um, so um, uh, the Chen paper, for instance, um, I guess you know, one of the important things was when the data were controlled for genetic relatedness, as you talked about, and um, cultural contact and borrowing, that's when a lot of the effects started to wash out. So this raises an important point, which you've obviously thought a lot about, which is you know, the fact that languages are not independent. Um, and um, from what I've been reading, there's something known as Galton's problem. Perhaps the statisticians in the room will know that better than I do. Um, I mean, similarities between cultures are also the product of borrowing um, and common descent. And this has to be really carefully controlled for, which, I mean, you've done some controlling for in that. Um, and especially important to do so the larger the data set gets so as not to inflate the degrees of freedom um, in the findings. Um, so um, I think that, uh, yeah, so you know, I think linguists might raise questions about clustering languages by grammatical gender maybe even within a family, which is you know, likely confounded with geographic distribution and with historical context, uh, historical context and modern day contact that certain branches of the family uh, that show less variation are also likely to be contiguous and spoken in the same areas and share a lot of cultural traits. Um, so maybe in the question period or over dinner, I'd, I'd, I'd be curious to talk to you more about um, why you chose that particular clustering method. And you know, as I say, I'm not a statistician, so I can't offer any better way to do so, but um, it's, it's one thing that I thought about. Um, so um, yeah, if you've not already done so more, it would also be good to take into account geographic location and cultural contact and historical um, historical context. So, you know, one thing that I was thinking about, like Jamaica versus the Dominican Republic, for instance, where you've got English versus Spanish. Yes, you have English versus Spanish in terms of gendered languages, but these are also, one is a British colony, former British colony, one's a former Spanish colony, and that's bringing all of that cultural baggage and social structure and political structure along with it, um, along with the language. Um, so you did a really yeah, impressive job of, of making this corpus, which I think linguists would probably also be interested in using this 4,300 languages coded for gender is, is, is extremely impressive. And I commend you for that. Um, but yeah, um, you know, recent work, like including Roberts, which you cited, has shown caution in using these sorts of large samples, uh, which can um, increase the likelihood of spurious correlations. Um, so uh, in a 2013 paper with Winters, um, they showed that a number of spurious correlations they could find, like linguistic diversity, correlates statistically with uh, traffic accidents. Um, phoneme inventory correlates with the levels of extramarital sex. Morphological complexity correlates with the number of siestas people take. I mean, a lot of things that nobody would really think are plausible, of course, right? They're statistically significant, but no one would seriously argue that your morphological complexity causes you to take naps. Um, so I think that the danger in using large data sets is, is in confirming biases or seemingly intuitively plausible hypotheses that aren't necessarily any more plausible from a grammatical standpoint than any of these, these other ones. Um, so in a paper from earlier this year, Thomas Papinski showed that essentially any correlation between a linguistic factor in walls and in the WBS could come out as significant. So I think there's just a caution um, in, in, you know, we need to have a healthy caution in using these kinds of results. Um, so, um, and I guess my other, my other thing that I was thinking about, which is not from a, a linguistic point of view necessarily, is just the, you know, going from labor force participation to gender equality more as, as a more broadly construed um, thing, right? Um, it, so, of course, I haven't seen your country by country, um, you know, labor force participation map. Um, but you know, I work in West Africa primarily where you know, there are not really gendered languages. None of the languages I've worked with are gendered languages. Uh, I don't know what the workforce participation is, but of course, um, women's equality is, is it's, it's terrible. I mean, it's just, uh, there's absolutely terrible inequality um, in this part of the world. And so you know, I wonder um, you know, whether labor force participation is going to be the right thing to say this is, this is equality or not, because clearly even in the US where we may have good workforce participation, we're a long right. way from being equal, right? Sure. Um, so um, I guess a few last questions or, that I would pose or things to think about maybe in continuing to, to work on this um, would be not just labor force participation, but what kinds of work men and women engage in. So you know, do you see gender distinctions within the workforce uh, that might be important in thinking about equality, different pay rates uh, related to what I said before? 
Um, another thing I'm wondering is how um, uh, studies like this would deal with multilingualism, which is the norm in so many of these areas. So if you speak both a gendered language and a non-gendered language, I mean, under Warfian's view, you've got two divisions of the world, and um, how does that play out? Um, you know, in term, and how does it deal with you know immigration in second languages? Um, you know, so if Spanish-speaking women, for instance, in the U.S. would show less participation in the workforce, you know, that could be due to socioeconomic status and immigration status, and not because of um, the language that they speak necessarily, right? Um, so I guess to sum up, and we can open this up to, to discussion, um, I really appreciate your meticulous work and the provocative questions that are raised by it. So I think studies like this present really an enormous opportunity to, to disentangle these things mm -hmm. that, that we still don't know, right? Um, you know, studies show yes, studies show no. Uh, linguists have biases in one way, and you know um, maybe economic uh, economists um, have biases in the other way. But we still don't know, and so we're still disentangling all of it. Um, and so I think it presents the opportunity to prefer, uh, to pursue these hypotheses on a smaller scale, uh, to look at experimental work like some of the studies that you cited. I think is going to be really important in figuring out uh, these effects. Um, and figuring out which aspects of language, so lexical aspects or grammatical aspects, uh, really are influencing the way that we think um, and view the world and to what degree. Um, so yeah, to sum up, I guess uh, the most exciting results, I think, in the future is going to come from interdisciplinary collaboration, um, bringing together the strengths and the viewpoints of economists, linguists, political scientists, behavioral psychologists um, to get at the heart of these issues. And I think we have to think really carefully about what kinds of policy recommendations could and should be made, um, especially concerning the balance of indigenous and minority language rights uh, with gender equality. Um, so yeah, that's all I have prepared. But thank you very much again for this interesting talk. Thank you. Yeah, so maybe I should just respond, and then we can take questions. So I mean, I think on your uh, the second point, I would say I think you're exactly right. So you know, one of the other hats I wear is in thinking about how we measure gender equality. Yeah. And a big problem is that there are no internationally valid measures of gender equality. Yeah. And so labor force participation is a widely used summary statistic of women's involvement in the labor force. It's certainly not the whole story, and I agree completely. I mean, first of all, I think, you know, sure, in the United States, we're very far from gender equality, but it's all relative. Of course, and so yes. by many measures, we're quite far along. Absolutely. I think when you look at West Africa, there's a huge amount of gender equality, but again, it is all relative, even within the African context. Mm -hmm. And so I think it is important to both point out that the most equal there is in the world is still not actually that equal on lots of margins. And so this is a relative a comparison in relative terms. But we don't have great measures that are internationally comparable in terms of gender equality. And this is something that people are actively working on in terms of debating how to measure empowerment and agency and what things you could use to operationalize that. Um, on, your, on your first point, and I think that this is related, uh, you know, that point about larger data sets lead to spurious correlations is only if you don't do your standard errors properly. And so that's part of what the permutation test is doing. If you're adjusting for clustering, what larger data sets do is give you statistical power. Mm -hmm. And so I think in particular, that study about the walls in the World Values Survey, that's a very small data set of languages and a very small data set of uh, of countries and outcomes. And so yes, in that kind of framework, you're not going to have the power to pick up a lot of real effects, and you're going to be tending to get a lot of spurious effects. Mm -hmm. But if you adjust your standard errors, then you're much better off having a larger data set that gives you the power to pick things up that you would not be able to see in a small data set and to do the standard errors correctly. And so one of the things that I took out of this talk is where we discuss how if you used the, the walls data set alone, and then you tried either through the permutation test or just correcting for the measurement error in, uh, in the languages we don't code to do correct inference, mm -hmm. you would not be able to say anything. So anyone who tells you there is a statistically significant correlation using only the walls is pulling your chain. They don't know how to do statistics. And so once you correct for that, you see that there is still this relationship, but it's only visible because we have this huge data set that gives us the power to do inference correctly. And yes, if you don't do inference correctly, then you can get a lot of spurious correlations. Now, the flip side of that is that if you start adding in things that are highly correlated with your treatment of interest, 
you will eventually come to a situation where things are not statistically significant because you have a bunch of collinear variables. And it is not telling you that there's no treatment effect. It's telling you that you can't pick up a treatment effect. And so we need to be careful in both directions to not interpret adding enough things that are highly correlated so that significance is unclear across a bunch of highly correlated things as evidence that something is not a true relationship, because that is certainly not what it is. It is evidence that we haven't pinned it down yet statistically. Mm -hmm. But none of those stories is giving you a precise zero on the effect of language. Right. And so we shouldn't interpret any of those as evidence that this is not a thing. We should interpret it as evidence that we need better, better data sets to be able to give a convincing answer to these yeah. questions. And I think that's part of what's important about trying to build. And even these things about the correlations, the thing with the walls is that the set of languages that has any attributes varies across attributes. That's true so then well. you can't look at correlations, you know, are these two things more strongly correlated than these two things? You can't do that when the set of countries that you're using is changing over time. Yeah. And so for a lot of these questions, we really do need to have better data sets in order to be able to answer them appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that's, thank you very much for the comments. Thank you very much for the pointers. And I mean, I completely agree with your point about minority languages. And when I talk about policy remedies, I mean, part of the point, and I didn't go through the model in excruciating detail, is that this is not a social constraint. This is a predisposition. And so the language is not, you know, if you think about what is a policy response to this, it isn't that the policy response is going to be changing the language or prioritizing one language. It's making people aware that this predisposition might nudge them in a particular direction so that they can change their behavior yeah. based on that awareness. Yeah. Um, and you know, part of what we're trying to do in the paper is highlight the fact that these little nudges can potentially add up to making women or other groups feel like they don't fit in in particular contexts. That isn't to say that the language is wrong. You know, I gave this talk once, and I sat down at the conference dinner afterwards, and the guy across from me said, this is great. I'm English. My wife is French. I've been arguing that the kids shouldn't learn French. You've given me so much ammunition. And I was like, no. that is not what we're trying to say. Not uh, the take-home message. Not the take-home message, exactly. And so just because the study is about language, it doesn't mean that the policy is, you know, some languages are better than others yeah. at all. No. Yeah. So we should probably open yep. it up to those to the people with lots of... First of all, thank you so much for your talk. Really, really fascinating and again exciting to sort of have this um, enormous data set to look at and sort of sift through. And, um, I have, I guess, kind of a wonky question, so I want to make sure I understand it before I actually ask it um, with regards to the permutation test. Mm -hmm. So, am I understanding correctly that uh, an an individual language will be included if it's a member of a larger group that is diverse in the in the kind of genetic, or kind of, excuse me, gender structure that it has. So all the languages are included, mm -hmm. and then the question is, how do you construct the, how do you construct the group that you're grouped with when you do the test? So basically the idea is that, you know, so intuitively, if, just to sort of explain clustering a little bit, so if I were doing a study of, you know, something that I was going to randomize within schools, then I would treat individuals as the unit of observation. But if I were going to say, you know, this school gets a program and this school doesn't, then the right way to deal with it is to treat the school as the unit of observation. Mm -hmm. And so basically we're saying the unit of observation in a statistical sense, though all the things remain in the data set, is these groups of languages, the largest homogeneous uh, clusters of languages within a tree that represent all of the parts of the tree from the leaves up to any point where everything below that node is homo homogeneous homo in grammatical gender. Gotcha. Okay. So um, thanks for that. I think yeah. I think then I, I I know what I'm asking, which I guess um, is it's my understanding that the size of linguistic branches uh, is not uniform across language families, mm -hmm. um, and I. Think and I want to ask maybe both of you, as you both have sort of you know been looking at this data, um, that the variation in um, gender language structures within groups is probably not uniform uh, between language families, right? Some are more uniform than others. Does that affect how we see you know between language families? Does that affect how we understand the um, you know, like 
how far along each branch between families we're including? No. So the point of this sort of permutation test-based approach that gets away from classical statistics is whatever the true underlying structure is, it's going to recover it, and it's going to give you the correct inference. So it, like, it's exactly set up to deal with this situation where some clusters are big and some clusters are small. And if I just treated them in a classical statistics sense, like these are all equal units of observation, then I could get very skewed p-values. But when you treat them non-parametrically in this permutation test framework, you get back whatever the structure is, you get back the right p-values. That's the way the permutation test approach works. OK, that's, that's terrific. Thank you. <laughs> I, I understand that way better. I really appreciate it. Can I follow up a, a question on yep. that, actually? Because yeah. still, um, I'm still curious about the way this clustering was, was working. Um, yep. So um, I guess two things that I would wonder about. You know, one is if you didn't do it as clustering, but simply controlled for um, essentially genetic relatedness of the language families, which also reflects even, which reflects cultural relatedness as well. Um, so right now, you're treating things as like kind of like clusters, and they're separate. And like this one's this cluster, and this one's that one. But at the end of the day, they're both still Indo-European, right? So if you controlled for language family, whether you would expect to see the same results. And the other thing is, what was I going to say? Oh, um, if you did a study, I'd be really curious to see what would happen if you did a study within one large language family, like Indo-European or like yeah. um, Afro-Asiatic, and looked at the data for languages and workplace, you know, participation or whatever it might be, these measures within a language family, yep. so that you're you know, wiping out that level yep. of variation, what you would expect to see. Yeah, so there are some studies that have done this within Europe. And so that's a subset of mm -hmm. Indo-European, but basically find that, this, that mm -hmm. this holds up as well within the European language family. But then it's a relatively small set of countries right. that you're dealing with. So I think your first point is a re like it's a really good question. So you're highlighting two different things, right? So what I'm talking about, there are two concerns. One is that our estimate of the relationship is biased. It's the correlation is not the true causal relationship yeah. because there are other variables that we have not controlled for that are correlated with both grammatical gender and the outcome that we care about. Yeah. Okay, So that's a, a bias story. The second thing is this concern about whether you're getting spurious relationships. And you're getting spurious relationships because you're not doing your standard errors correctly. Yeah. So the permutation test is addressing the latter. Okay, So it's addressing the fact that you're you've got this relatedness within families, and so therefore, because of you know, all these other factors that evolve with families, you're going to overstate the significance of the result. You're yeah. going to overstate how much variation there is. And so the permutation test is addressing the standard error side of things mm -hmm. so that we can do the inference correctly. It is not addressing what economists would call the identification side of things, yeah. where there's this possibility that there are omitted factors that we can't control for. So we do that by controlling for geography. That's why we bring in the data from the ethnographic atlas. Now, the problem with controlling for genetic relatedness within a language family is that those are very highly correlated. So you can't have two very highly correlated things in a regression and think that you're getting back the true impact of either of them. So if a thing is sufficiently highly correlated with your treatment, then you can only get sort of the confounded, the com combined impact of those. Now, you can't say then that adding one as a control means that neither of them is important. You should then just only test them jointly. And so that's part of what happened in the Winters paper, is that once you add a lot of things, you make it so that you don't have the power to pick up even a very large treatment effect. So certainly it is the case that if there, you know, what is it about genetic relatedness? That's not necessarily, like, genetic relatedness is not an omitted factor. That's saying there's some other omitted factor that might move with, mm -hmm. within a family. Mm -hmm. So controlling for genetic relatedness isn't what you want to do. You want to adjust for the non-independence. Right. If there's a specific thing, so, you know, th distance to Rome or something right. like that, that's an omitted variable that right. could, could cause a bias. And then if you think those are important, you want to control right. for them. Right. Um, but the right way to deal with the fact that these language families are non-independent is to think about, and you could think about, are there slightly different ways you could do the clustering? But that is an inference and uh -huh. not an identification yeah, yeah, yeah. problem. I get yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I guess I just, you know, when I look at the map, obviously the, the map of gendered languages is like, it's Indo-European and it's Afro-Asiatic, right? I mean, that's like the bulk of our gendered languages are, are in these two very large families, and in these two very large families that happen to be contiguous, 
right? Um, and in these two families that both arose from the middle of Eurasia, which happened to be the place that plows and mm -hmm. you know cattle and all of these other things have arisen. And so, you know, it just it makes me wonder. Okay, does this have anything to do with you know having gender in your language, or it's just they were kind of all in the right place at the right time, um, you know? And they also happened to divide the world up in this way. Um, you know, other languages divide the world up in different ways, and it seems to be a sort of arbitrary grammatical division. That that yeah. I guess the question is whether it reflects anything deeper psychologically. Yeah, I mean, and I think that for all papers that are trying, like, I think that there's this tension because it is clear that there are a lot of cultural things that are really important determinants of society and how we behave. And it is also clear that a lot of things move together and there's only one history of the mm -hmm. earth. So right. we can't induce <laughs> as much experimental variation as we might like to separate these <laughs> things out. And so I think there's this tension yeah. where you should always be cautious in saying this is a causal relationship. But on the other hand, we've controlled for continent fixed effects. We've controlled for all of these ethnographic characteristics of those societies and pre that then predict which societies become larger. And so we're doing a lot to try to address mm -hmm. those things. But I mean, it's always the case that if there is some other thing heretofore undocumented in the ethnographic record right. that is driving this, then there's no way that we can rule that right, out. Right, right, of course. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of uh, Germanic languages that have abandoned gender. Is that a large enough phenomenon to be something that would pop up on your radar? Or Well, English, uh, most notably. Yeah, English, right? Dutch, part, Danish. Part of Dutch, yep. And, yeah. so, and this is what some of these studies that look explicitly, exclusively within Europe have been getting at. And they find a similar thing. Um, but you know, it's a relatively small sample of languages and countries. And, and so, it's relatively recent. And relatively, I mean, relatively recent. English was a thousand years ago, yeah. so relatively Dutch recent. And yes, Danish but more recently. But yeah, I was just wondering if that's yeah. Of any and so interest. people have looked at this within Europe and see a similar thing. But you know, in all of these cases, it's very you know. But that's basically Northern Europe versus Southern Europe, and so this is why we think it's nice to then bring in variation from Africa, also India, and show that within these very different, far removed sets. Uh, of languages, you see the same pattern showing up. One um, other thing that I was I was thinking and looking at your slides, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about was um, the uh, educational participation versus the labor force participation, and how increase in education didn't impact increase in labor force participation. Um, Am I, so I may have been misunderstanding you in your talk, but you seem to suggest that maybe this is because there are these greater cultural things like language or linguistic things that are nudging people. But it seems to me that, I mean, education and labor force are kind of apples and oranges in the sense like education can be mandated, labor force participation is not. Education is at a non-childbearing age while labor tends to be at a childbearing age. And so just because you know girls are getting schooling, doesn't entail that they will go on to join the labor force. And that has sort of nothing to do with language, right? That has everything to do with um, you know, the fact that they may be having children and society's views on what women should be doing with children and you know, whether or not they are forced to by the government. So I'm wondering what your, your thoughts are on that. Yeah, so I mean, I think, uh, so in economics, we sort of think about human capital as a major determinant of wages because it is, right. and the wages are a major determinant of whether people enter the labor force. Uh, now, there are also a lot of cultural constraints. And so that last illustration was not to say there is no relationship between changing the gender gap and women in education and labor force participation, and that's all the effect of language. It's to say that we typically think of, and this has motivated a lot of policy related to educational equality mm -hmm. over the last 50 years. I mean, the gender, women's educational attainment has increased dramatically since 1960 around the world. The gender gap in educational attainment has declined somewhat, but men's educational atta attainment has also increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. And this has translated into a more productive labor force. But women catching up to men in terms of their educational attainment has not at all translated into women catching up to men in terms of their participation in the labor force. Right. So then we have to say, so what is it about this tendency to think that maybe women shouldn't be in the labor force, or maybe when because women have to bear children, they should be focused on being in the home? 
what is it that makes that norm so sticky so that even as women have fewer children and you know it becomes more feasible to have you know we have formula D children don't need to breastfeed for two or three years so that they don't die of drinking unclean water women's productivity is enhanced by these improvements and that should be getting women into the labor force and interacting with their human capital and yet we see that we're solving the human capital side of the equation in terms of gender equality and it's not solving the other side of the equation at all so we're left with what is unexplained it's these cultural and social factors not all of which are language you know language may be a relatively minor one of right. these but they're not factors that are related to you know we can mandate that girls catch up to boys in school but we can't as you say mandate changes in cultural norms and the cycle and social so psychological and social factors so then we need to try to understand what are and we know that these factors are very persistent over time and so you know for educational attainment you can go back to 1950 in the Barrowley data set for labor force participation you can go back to 1990 these relationships are basically not changing with mm -hmm. grammatical gender these cultural factors are very sticky and we need to try to understand where they come from to think about how we can nudge them in a better direction yeah. Thank you.